On today's show, the Hawks simply seem to run out of gas in Dallas, and they fall by a 14-point margin at the hands of the Mavericks. We'll get into all of what transpired, what might have caused this loss, the offensive struggles, and much more. And all of that is coming up. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1688 of the Lockdown Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland, coming to you on a Thursday evening into Friday here in early April. And I want to encourage you at the top of the podcast, as I always do, to make us your first listen here at Lockdown Hawks each and every day. Please subscribe to the podcast. Check us out anywhere you get your podcasts. That includes Spotify and Apple Podcasts, as well as YouTube on the video side. It's been a very busy week on the podcast. This is our fifth episode in as many days and uh, plenty to get to in the archive if you missed anything along the way. But the focus of today's episode will actually be on a loss for the Hawks, 109-95 to 95 in Dallas on this Thursday. It was a back-to-back with travel for the Hawks that ended up playing a real part in the game, as it often does in a situational spot that is that challenging. It was the Hawks' only visit to Dallas this year. It was actually rescheduled by a day. Um, it was going to be back-to-back either way for the Hawks because they play again on Saturday, but it happened to be that they had to go from Atlanta to Dallas instead of going from Dallas to Denver. I'm not sure which one of those is better, but still treacherous along the way because Dallas is at full strength and has been full rest, I should say, in this game. Also, a rematch of the wild contest earlier this year where Luka Doncic had 73 points in Atlanta in a game that had very little defense, we'll say. Um, but, you know, all that's all that said, like, you never know how much it accounts for the results in the game. We're always guessing about how it, it impacts things, but certainly one team was rested, the other team was not. And uh, at the end of the game, it surely, it surely appeared that the Hawks ran out of gas. In the fourth quarter. Now they were already losing, as we'll come back to later on in the podcast. So it wasn't like they were assured of winning, but they simply could not score in the last six minutes. They scored two points in the last six minutes, and that was actually at the free throw line. So uh, a power outage at the end of the game for sure. They did start the game well, actually led by as many as eight points in the first half. That was back before halftime to a more neutral game state. They were actually, they were actually down by eight by halftime. They actually were trailing the whole second half. So it wasn't like they were in control at any point, but it was very competitive. The Hawks were within seven points in the fourth quarter. It was They were right there on the doorstep of being in this game, but they just couldn't score late, ended up losing by 14 points, and uh, we'll get into all of how it kind of unfolded on this podcast. Um, just as a reset a little bit here, the Hawks were still at their same injury level that they've been at recently. Um, Jalen Johnson is back, as is Kobe Bupkin, but the Hawks are still without five guys, headlined by, of course, Trey Young, Anyeke Kongwu, etc., um, Dallas also did have two guys in rotation that were out in this game, Derek Lively and Josh Green. But as a sort of background here, our friends at FanDuel Sportsbook made the Hawks 11 and a half or 12 point underdogs, depending on where you got this number right before the game actually started. That is actually the third biggest underdog the Hawks have been all year long and the biggest against a team that was not named Boston. Of course, the Hawks just beat twice, but they're obviously quite good this year. So the... Projections were obviously skeptical of the Hawks in this game. They were in that number most of the way, ended up not covering that number, but it was kind of a, a good indication of the uphill battle the Hawks were in, in for in this game, and it kind of played out that way along the way. So, um, look, big picture, I have to say this, like it was the offense that was the failure side of the floor in this game. Essentially nothing went well on paper in this game. If you watched it, it was kind of the same story, um, you know, with your eyes or with the actual stats in this one. The Hawks had a 91 offensive rating in the game that is very 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 poor um a 76 offensive rating in the second half including a sub 60 offensive rating in the fourth quarter so that speaks for itself in some ways if you follow this stuff closely you know just let's just say ballpark a pretty bad offense in the modern nba is in the 105 to 110 range and the hawks were 90, 91 in this game um i do believe the time played a part at some point in the fourth quarter but it's just hard to do that kind of production against a defense that's okay in Dallas, but not special by any means. And to kind of go out and do that, it's pretty rough from the Hawks in this game. Um, they didn't shoot it well, as they, as I kind of said, like nothing went well, but they were 40% from the field in this game, 45% on twos, which is really rough. 34% from the three is actually like okay-ish, but kind of below average still. They were below average overall offensively and with their, with their shooting. They were five of 20 from the field in the fourth quarter. And again, a 56 offensive rating in the fourth, pretty rough. Also at the free throw line, they got there 21 times, actually actually more than Dallas did, but they actually missed seven free throws. So that's not what you want. 
And the other big stat that I will give you besides the poor shooting was that the Hawks had 21 turnovers. And Atlanta just cannot live that way right now, especially with their lack of firepower, with Trey out, all that stuff. Um, and really, even with Trey, it doesn't really matter. You can't turn the ball over 21 times. That's just the reality of the situation that happened in this game, especially late. They were kind of just could not hold on to the ball, and that hurt them. Um, they were below average in assists. They were below average on the glass. Like, nothing went well offensively. Only one guy on the whole roster shot more than 50% from the field in this game, and that was Garrison Matthews, who was actually quite good. Um, but the starting lineup got rocked. If you listen to the podcast yesterday, I broke down what became a nice win for the Hawks at home, but the starters were awesome on Wednesday, and the bench got absolutely drilled, even, even, even in a lopsided victory for the Hawks. Tonight, it was the exact opposite. The starters got blitzed, and the bench actually held up pretty well in this game. But in the end, the starters playing more minutes, they got beat up, and that ended up being what kind of led to this loss. As a starting five, they were actually 21 of 61 from the field, which is 34%, and uh, that is untenable for this team. So, obviously, it's not a breaking news segment to, to say that the Hawks scored 95 points in the game. That was their weaker side. But aside, basically, after the first quarter, the Hawks were pretty bad offensively in this game. And in the second half, it was jarringly bad. Defensively, if you want to kind of end, or, end on a higher note here, and a more encouraging note, they did the job defensively for most of the night. Now, it wasn't perfect. They got torched in the middle of the game for sure. Dallas had a 40-point quarter that... You know, the Hawks had some trouble defensively in the middle of the game once Luka and Kyrie kind of had it going. But the Mavs scored 16 points in the fourth quarter and won the quarter, which is a good microcosm of the game overall. The Hawks did a good job defensively in the fourth quarter. Flat out, they played good defense for, the, for most of the fourth quarter. If you watch it back on tape, it just didn't matter because they couldn't score. Dallas shot the ball very similarly to the Hawks did, actually. Um, below average on um, field goal attempts, two-pointers, three-pointers, all that stuff across the board. They were better at the free throw line in this game. And again, the big number was the turnover battle where the Hawks had 21 giveaways. Dallas only had 14. A plus seven there or a minus seven there for the Hawks is uh, really, really damaging. Dallas took nine more shots from the field in this game. That ended up pr proved to be pretty important. And the other aspect that the Hawks have struggled in a lot this year has been their transition defense. And if you're a new listener or a recurring listener, you probably heard me say at some point somewhere, the Hawks have been very bad in getting back and executing all year long defensively in that particular aspect. That happened again. They were, they're actually still bottom three in the league in that category. They allowed 19 fast break points in this game, which is a ton for a team that doesn't run a ton in Dallas. Um, that undersells, honestly, how, how bad they were at, at times getting back in this game. So there's all of that. Um, they actually held, and that's going to sound funny to say held, but they held Luka and Kyrie to 51 points. And if you said that, I think you actually have to take that. You know, Luka was projected to score in the mid-30s in this game. He's the leading, leading scorer in the league. Kyrie was human in this one. Like they definitely, they, they, they did, they did their damage for sure. They're really good players, but the Hawks did a decent job kind of containing those guys other than the middle of the game for a few minutes. But you know, the rest of it was kind of just rough. And overall, the offense just kind of let them down in this game. That's pretty, pretty, pretty easy to see. I would say I was just watching it and especially on the stat sheet. And yes, before we move on, I thought there was a, a lot of weird slash bad officiating in this game. I rarely talk about that. Um, there were a few moments in this game that were pretty jarringly poor. A lot of it got changed on challenges that ended up kind of being overturned or whatever. But uh, there were some bad moments. I'm not sure that's going to, you know, a lot of times people like, like, like cost the Hawks the game. I wouldn't say that by any means, but there were some, uh, let's just say, less than stellar officiating moments in this one. That did not necessarily help things for Atlanta. But in the end, the offense was the problem, and it was the reason why the Hawks were not able to get over the hump and get an upset victory on the road on this Thursday. All right, we'll have more coming up on this game. If you missed it, we'll have a full kind of breakdown of how this game unfolded from start to finish as well. At the end of the podcast, we'll talk about how each player in the rotation fared for Atlanta. But first, I'll tell you about our friends at Robinhood. Today's show is brought to you by Robinhood. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you could still have an IRA? Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is, is boosting every single dollar you transfer in for other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on a 3% match. Robinhood Gold gives you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com boost. Sub fees apply and now for some legal information. Claim as of Q1 2024 validated by Raise Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401k. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of the first 3% match. 
Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is up to specific terms and conditions. IRA, Robinhood IRA, available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC, member SIPC, is a registered broker-dealer. All right, and as mentioned before, the Hawks actually started this game pretty well and ended up winning the first quarter by six points. They played well at the start. There was a nice... Uh, pushing the pace by Jalen Johnson early in the game, finding Capella for a dunk to begin the begin the contest. That's kind of a clunky start overall on both sides. Like Luca actually struggled for a while, and if you remember the first time, the first game, there was no struggling at all from Luca. But one key difference in this game is that DeAndre Hunter played, and I mentioned that on the, on the show. I actually, listened to part of that show uh, today in preparation about my breakdown of that wild game against Dallas in Atlanta. But crucially, Hunter is far and away their best defensive option against Doncic in particular. Uh, Luka is, of course, very big, but he's not very fast. And Hunter struggles sometimes against smaller guys who are quicker than he is. Luka is not quick, but he is sort of, you know, crafty to be sure, and also super skilled and massive and strong. Hunter is big enough to handle him. And look, he didn't stop him, but he did a much better job against Luka. It was not like a total domination like it was the first time. And in the first quarter, he didn't score, which was a credit to Hunter for sure. Um, rotationally, it was the same story as it was the other night. Joe Johnson ended up starting. They played Garrison, Viet, Krejci, and Bruno Fernando off the bench along with, along with Cody Buckham. And in the fourth quarter, it was a brief Wes Matthews stint um, out of nowhere in the fourth. But um, that was kind of it for the night. Um, there was a wild sequence in the middle of the first quarter with about two minutes left in the quarter where there were two or three no calls. And Quinn was going pretty nuts. The Hawks thing got, got a call on a blocking foul against Dallas. And then Garrison Matthews got a technical foul going into the timeout. He thought he got fouled on the previous play and was chirping about that. And then in the timeout, Dallas challenged a blocking foul and got it overturned to a second foul on DeAndre Hunter. So all of that was bad for the Hawks. Not only just the weirdness, the technical foul, the second on Hunter. And uh, that was one of those moments that I was talking about earlier about how just there was a lot of uh, uneven officiating in this one. Um, another bad break in the minute after that was that actually uh, Tim Hardaway Jr., old friend, missed a three so badly off the side of the backboard. Then it went right to, to Dwight Powell for a layup. Because it's one of those uh, ball, maybe lied situations there. But late in the quarter, they closed, the, they closed things well. V had a four-point play, and then Kobe Buckin had a tough jump shot at the buzzer of the quarter. And then before that, by the way, Buckin had a great defensive possession where he got two or three efforts along the way and ended up with a steal on the play. They shot it well in the first quarter, and all was right with the world. They were up as, by as many as eight points in the second quarter. Honestly, I don't mean to be mean about this, but uh, Jaden Hardy the young Dallas guard, talented player. He's 21 years old, like a lot of upside in the future. He had one of the uglier first half stints that I can recall, honestly. Um, he came in, I think, maybe one more time very briefly after that, but he was so bad in that first half stint. He missed his first three, first three shots and then also committed two fouls, and they both resulted in four-point plays in the same stretch. It was wild. Anyway, um, there was a stretch, though, when Hunter was off the floor, and Luca was on, where he kind of got going a little bit. V. Krejci tried his best against Luca, but could not hold could not hold that down. Not that's not Vite's fault. Just not a bad that's a bad matchup for him. In a lot of ways, he got going a little bit. Um, they allowed actually a 10-0 run going into halftime in the last 93 seconds. That's tough to see for the Hawks being up by two to being down by eight at halftime. That was a brutal blow. There was a comical three by Luca at the, on, on the final play. Like, what are you going to do there? Nothing. Shrug your shoulders and kind of be frustrated about that, of course. But Dallas had 40 points in the quarter. Luka had 16, 5-5 five five in the second quarter alone. And that ended up being a pretty big swing. There were some tough whistles for sure. Um, but, uh, you know, the Hawks being down 8 at the half with how they played for most of that first half was uh, certainly unfortunate. Um, first half, by the way, Garrison Matthews had 14 points. That was his biggest scoring first half of the year. But the Hawks missed free throws. They had a lot of 11 threes. Like, it was kind of rough along the way. Weirdly, in the first half, Bogey was really bad. Now, he wasn't great in the whole game overall, but... Second half, he actually made a bunch of shots. First half, he was brutal, but then he had 13 points in the third quarter to kind of put the Hawks, not on his back, but he was certainly the impetus of the offense um, in the second half for a large portion of it. It was kind of a static quarter. Dallas made some shots, and they actually made five threes in the quarter. Um, the Hawks were actually down by 16 points with a minute to go or so in the third quarter. And then, I would say it was teetering for sure at that point in time, but true to this team so far this year, to their credit, they battled back. They were resilient. They did not roll over in that point in time. They had a 9-0 run to end the third and start the fourth quarter. They were back within seven. Um, and honestly, that was uh, encouraging. Now, there's a bit of a scary moment in the fourth quarter um, with Jalen Johnson hobbling around a little bit on the right leg that's been favoring him for a while. Of course, he had, he had the two ankle injuries kind of back-to-back. -back. It was not the ankle that I could see on the tape. He actually he, he, he did come back in the game 
about three minutes later. That's a good sign. It looked like he might have banged knees, and uh, hopefully that's nothing uh, serious. He ended up playing after that, so um, hopefully just an exhale moment there for everybody involved. But, of course, you're keeping an eye on him closely as not only a good player now, but a huge part of the future for Atlanta. Again, there were a number of officiating issues all night long. Quinn ended up having to challenge a pretty obvious out-of-bounds call in the fourth quarter that, like, he won the challenge, but you should have to challenge that. It was very obviously the wrong call. Um, in fact, Hunter had five fouls. Like, he ended up making it to the end of the game without fouling out, but he was kind of uh, on pins and needles for a large portion of that fourth quarter. But then, sort of, the swing happened. And, look, I shouldn't even say swing because it was ended up kind of being dead even in some respects. But the end of this game was uh, about as pedestrian or worse than that offensively as you'll ever see at the end of a game. For one, the fourth quarter was 16 to 14 in a close, in a, in a competitive game. That's tells the story on some level, but how about this? There was a stretch for almost four minutes where no one scored. The Hawks had eight trips in a row. They didn't score in, the, in that time period, including four consecutive turnovers. Dallas didn't score for seven straight times on the court. So no one scored for about four minutes. That isn't like the biggest disaster in the world because obviously nothing's happening, so you're not losing ground. But when you're down by nine, you can't really have that happen. So you're already on the ropes. Dallas breaks that streak of not scoring with a three. And when that actually happens, the Hawks are down by 12 with under three to go, and it's kind of over at that point. Like, it wasn't over, over, but that stretch of the Hawks just not being able to take advantage. Like, in a brighter world, you could say the Hawks got seven stops in a row, which is what you need to do when you're down by nine in the fourth quarter is just get a bunch of stops. They just could not put the ball in the basket. And again, four turnovers in a row is not going to help that. Um, ultimately, this is probably the stat of the night in some ways. The Hawks had 11 consecutive possessions where they did not score a point. 11 plays in a row with zero points. It's hard to do in the NBA. It is. They didn't score for five and a half minutes. And how about this? They only scored because Kyrie committed a foul on purpose. Like, if you watch the play, he actually fouls on purpose because the game was ostensibly over and he wanted to come out of the game. So that is the only point the Hawks scored in the final six and a half minutes of the game was Kyrie committing a pretty much intentional foul, put a bow game on the line, he made both free throws, and that was literally it for the Hawks in the last six and a half minutes of the game. No field goals, two points. The Hawks played well defensively in the fourth quarter. They really did. But you can't go 11 possessions in a row without scoring. And I think it was in the end, it was like 14 possessions with two points. And again, they were kind of gifted two points. So uh, look, it's one game, it's one quarter, it's one half, whatever it is. The Hawks do have a firepower issue right now with their current allotment of players. I'm going to stay away from the rabbit hole right now on that. But um, yeah, it was just kind of a perfect storm. Nothing went well. They were, I'm sure they were gassed at that point in time. I've been saying it for a while, but you know, DeJounte and Bogey in particular are playing these huge minute totals. They're carrying huge workloads because they kind of have to right now. But um, I think everybody by the end of the game was pretty gassed for the Hawks. And Dallas wasn't great either. But unfortunately, the Hawks already gave up, gave up the lead. They were already down by nine, ten points. And they could kind of, Dallas could kind of afford that when the Hawks couldn't. So there you go. All right, we'll have more coming up in a second about our uh, player breakdowns in this one. Very few guys played super well in this one, although we had at least one positive with Garrison Matthews. But we'll get to all of that and more coming up. But first, a word from our friends at Amazon Fire TV. Amazon Fire TV is your destination for sports, from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. And Fire TV also, also offers amazing viewing experiences for smart TVs as well as the Fire TV Stick. You can plug into your existing TV. It provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes as well as free and live TV. And with the Amazon Fire TV situation, you can also find baseball and basketball, other sports you might be interested in, and you're going to have all of that on a Fire TV. They also created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite brands in the sports world all for free. That includes us, by the way, at Lots on Podcast Network, and that includes me, of course, and most of the big pro leagues as well as college conferences. And Fire TV channels sort of dive into all the game analysis and highlights and much more. Keep up, keep up to date on all of the latest in the world of sports from March Madness to the NBA MLB, football when it's in season, and much more. Not to mention they have great news. They have entertainment. They have cooking. They have gaming. They have travel. All those videos are in the same place at Amazon Fire TV channels. And check out Fire TV channels and Fire TV on Alexa devices right now. If you haven't done it just yet, you should. Trust me on this. And to learn more, visit Amazon.com slash LockedOnFireTV. One more time, the place to go is Amazon.com slash LockedOnFireTV. <laughs> 
Today's show is brought to you by Nissan, and do you have to be the kind of driver that pushes things a little bit further when you're behind the wheel? Do you ever wonder what adventures could be waiting for you around that next corner? Our friends at Nissan have a lot of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to that next level. The 2024 Nissan Rogue is perfect for city drives and for great escapes alike. It has classic, a class-exclusive Google built-in that you're always updating Assistant to call for almost anything that you need. Gone are the days of connecting your phone because Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store are built right into the 12.3-inch HD infotainment system. It's touchscreen as well. It's an awesome system. And 2024 Rogue is perfect for mid-size crossover for your next big adventure. That's an incredible lineup at Nissan that includes the 2024 Nissan Pathfinder, which is up to eight people, has expensive cargo capacity, and as long, along with advanced available 4x4 capability with Nissan Pathfinder, 284 horsepower, up to 6,000 pounds of towing, when adventure calls, the Pathfinder is going to be there to answer that call for you. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, Nissan Armada, and go and find your next big adventure with Nissan. Shop NissanUSA.com. One more time, that's NissanUSA.com. All right, so the player stuff in this contest, and as mentioned before, the bench was actually better than starters for the most part in this game, at least uh, you know going against Dallas's bench along the way. Um, West Matthews played four minutes all in the fourth quarter. The Hawks have been doing this a little bit more recently where West will come in ice cold. I'm not really sure what they're trying to do there other than it's just kind of odd, but he's a veteran. He knows how to prepare himself. He was fine when he came in the game. He was actually plus two in those minutes, but missed two threes that uh, he was kind of along with everybody else in the fourth quarter. They couldn't make a shot down the stretch. Um, Beat Krejci, pretty quiet for him. Four points, 15 minutes for V, three assists, two rebounds. Um, I think you're kind of seeing now a little bit of what I talked about this week on the podcast, we'll talk about Veet. Like, I think he's going to play, but gone are the days now. As long as Jalen and DeAndre are healthy, Veet's not going to play huge minutes. He's going to play supporting minutes, which is understandable. He's a guy who's not proven himself on the biggest stage just yet, other than a small sample size. But he's still playing fine. He's moving the ball well. Defensively, he had his hands full with Luka in this one for sure, but ended up you know moving the ball well, three assists, four, four points, and uh, looked fine to me. Um, Kobe Bufkin had a nice game. Nine points. Had three rebounds, an assist, and a steal. I think he at least had a block that was not credited as well. He was three of four on twos, one of four on threes. Um, played well. Defensively looks good to me. Um, I'm still encouraged. Obviously, it's been an injury plague season for Kobe in some ways, but when he's been out there in the last couple of months, he looks good to me. So he's 20 years old. I would be encouraged if I by his play if I was a Hawks fan. The defensive stuff especially and the way that he operates on offense. He's a very versatile player. He's got good size, all that stuff. Lots to be excited about, about Kobe Bufkin in the future. I thought Bruno was better tonight. I thought he was pretty bad last night. I talked about that on the podcast a lot. He was much improved tonight. 10 points, five rebounds, two assists, a steal, and a block for Bruno in 19 minutes. Got the line six times. Only made four of them, but that's, that's actually just totally fine for him. Um, yeah, I thought he played with good intensity. I think he was uh, not feeling great about last night's performance. I'm sure he wasn't because he was not very good, but I thought he played well tonight, which is good to see from Bruno. And then Garrison Matthews was kind of the star of the first half. He didn't play a lot in the second half. I'm not... I didn't love that, actually. Like, in real time, I was kind of wondering why he wasn't playing more in the second half. Obviously, you want to lead under starters, but even in the third quarter, he was kind of uh, quiet, I would say. But Garrison had 14 points in the game. He was 2 of 3 on 2s and 3 of 3 on 3s. And how about this? Garrison Matthews has been one of the best shooters in the NBA this year. Full stop. Now, he's not playing a ton, but for the season now, he's shooting 46.9% from 3. Only one player in the league who qualifies for the title of three-point champion this year is shooting as good or better than that, and it's Grayson Allen. One guy. And Garrison is right on the doorstep of that. In fact, he's almost close to qualifying for three-point title. I'm not sure he's going to get there, but he isn't, like, super far away. He's played a lot of minutes this year. He's a bench guy, but he's taken a lot of threes, made a lot of threes. Also, recently, he's 32 of his last 57 from three. That's 56%. So he's been red hot. I did a segment on Tuesday night on the podcast about how hot the Hawks have been as a team shooting wise. Um, that kind of manifested itself along the way along you know, several guys, but basically everyone has been hot, at least that they had to that point um, other than other than Hunter, but Garrison was up top of the list. He's been scorching hot for about five weeks now. And uh, you know, he's a great shooter. I think he's not quite this level shooter, but he's a great shooter. And I think it's just worth noting like how good he has been as a marksman this year but it anyway, was really good tonight and uh, encouraging stuff there uh to the starters not a lot of guys played super well by their standards in this game uh jalen johnson six points in 36 minutes he was three of 11 on twos of one of threes uh finishing issues along the way for jalen in this game that are uh, playing him still i think he's gonna have a lot of nights uh sort of this year he's had some moments where he's had been kind of in between on finishes as he gets older and more mature and more uh sort of you know comfortable 
I think it'll be a lot more physical on those some of the finishes, and his efficiency will be better. But um, not not really worried about that. Also, was good on the glass. 16 rebounds for Jalen in this game, go along with four assists. He played fine. He just didn't finish well around the rim. Uh, DeAndre Hunter, 13 points, five fouls, um, one of three on, th- on twos, I should say, two of seven on threes. Um, he was okay. I thought he did a good job on Luka, honestly. I know Luka has 25, 12, and eight, but I thought Hunter did a good job on him, like legitimately good. And that's a strength of his for sure. Uh, but it was just an okay game for him on the whole. Uh, Capella was not as good tonight as he has been recently. Six points, 13 rebounds, did have five turnovers. That's a rough one for Clint. Did have a steal and a block. Um, missed at least one bunny, and I will not do my, my bit that I always do, but I thought Clint was just okay, maybe even worse than okay in this game compared to previous ones. He's been red hot, like his numbers are crazy good for about the last six weeks, but not his best night tonight by any means. And then uh, Bogey and DeJounte, equally not great in this one. Bogey in the first half was brutal. He was better in the second half for sure, ended up with 17 points on 15 shots, seven rebounds, two assists. He was fine once he kind of found it, but it was first, in the first half it was uh, unsightly for sure. And then DeJounte had one of his worst games in a while, honestly. 16 points, um, four assists, five rebounds, minus 16. He was four turnovers. He was three of eight on twos, three of nine on threes. Only one trip to the line tonight. Like, he wasn't, like, awful, but he was not the same guy he's been recently. So the combination of, like, look, if, if all I tell you right now is that the Hawks don't have their best nights from all three, oh, sorry, all four of their starters besides the center on offense, like, they're not going to score enough. That, that's the play. I mean, it, it could be as simple as DeJounte and Bogey, but just to be generous, I'll go beyond that and say also include Jalen and DeAndre. If all four of those guys are below average on offense, and they were in this game, the Hawks won't be able to score enough. And that's where they were in this one. So we'll leave it there for now. Um, the Hawks, nothing to be embarrassed about. Like, you know, lose this game by double digits, but they were, again, big underdogs, impossible travel spot, shorthanded team. Dallas has been playing really well recently. Like, it's okay. Don't nothing to panic about in this particular game. So from here, another real challenge. The Hawks go to Denver. So it's only a two game road trip. You don't often only go to Denver on a two game trip, but that was kind of a weird scheduling quirk at the end of the season. Um, the Nuggets are, of course, the champs. They are thirty one and eight at home this season. Um, that tells the story. They're always awesome at home. Nothing is easy there whatsoever. It's winnable still. Like the Hawks have obviously been showing themselves to be able to beat good teams. They beat Boston twice recently, they beat the Clippers recently. Like they can beat good teams, but that's a tough one for sure on the road um, with where the current roster is for sure. Um, but anyway, we'll have a full coverage and breakdown of that game. As a PSA, that's a nine o'clock start on Saturday night. It's also smack dab in the middle of the final four, which I will be actually covering in person in Arizona. So I'll be watching Hawks Nuggets. I'll probably be the only person in the entirety of State Farm Stadium, which holds like 8,000 people watching Hawks Nuggets. But uh, I will be doing that out of the corner of my eye as I'm covering Final Four basketball. So uh, the the grind never stops. But I will have a podcast. It might be a little bit later than usual, but that's also a late game. So 9 o'clock start on Saturday in Denver. And that's their last like kind of late game West Coast trip of the whole year. Because after that, they have two more road games, but they're very close road games. So this is the one kind of late night special. And at least it's on Saturday. So there you go. Stay tuned. Please subscribe to this podcast anywhere you get your podcast, places like Apple and Spotify, as well as YouTube on the video side. Like, subscribe, rate, review, share. All that stuff is very much appreciated. Auto download the podcast if you are trying to support the show. Also, follow our sponsors across the board. We have an extra um, show on our podcast network on the audio side as well. The folks at Locked On Sports Atlanta are also in our audio feed. They'll actually be labeled as the postcast if you see that in your audio feeds. That's just extra content. Nothing less from me at all. Also follow the show on Twitter at Lots on Hawks. Follow me there as well at BT Roland. Follow my Patreon work at patreon.com slash BT Roland. And uh, hopefully you will be uh, take some sort of value from that product if you choose to follow along with it. Thanks for listening to the podcast, everybody. I really do appreciate it. And uh, without any further delay, we'll sign off now. We'll see you after the game on Saturday.